Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the pubcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal agriculture. Tonight, we're continuing a conversation started during the Real Science Lecture Series, where we looked deeper into the impact of thermal processing on protein quality. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here at The Real Science Exchange. Tonight, we welcome back Dr. Chad Polk from Kansas State University. Chad is an associate professor of feed science and management in the Department of Grain Science and Industry. Chad, this is your second trip to the exchange. You were a guest of your colleague, uh, Dr. Jordan Gebhardt. So welcome back to the exchange. It's always good to see a uh, familiar face once again. Uh, first, before we get started, tell us, um, what are you drinking tonight? Well, I'm currently in the office, so I'm drinking water, but I, I do <laughs> want to give a shout out to my favorite brewery, Terrapin in Athens. Um, I think with the dogs being number one in the country, they deserve, you know, yeah. a good shout out. Before we get started, tell us how you got started in, uh, in the uh, poultry industry. Actually, I'm a swine nutritionist swine. by training. Okay. And uh, about three years ago, I joined the feed science group here at K-State, um, where we do a lot of feed processing research. And it all started uh, with doing phytase stability work. And a lot of this came from the poultry industry. And that's actually how I initially got connected with JT as he was kind of doing the same thing in his PhD work at NC State. So we had a lot of conversations about it and just the opportunity to connect feed research and poultry research uh, really just pulled me into the poultry side of things, really got interest in how, how feed processing, feed manufacturing influences both pigs and chickens. And so that's really what, what got me into the, the poultry side. All right, cool. So you've already mentioned your guest, JT. Would you mind uh, introducing him just a bit more? Yes. Yeah, so JT was a uh, PhD student at NC State when we first met. Um, did a lot of back and forth discussing phytate stability, enzyme stability, the pelleting process, and uh, how we influence things. And JT, you're currently with... I'm House with House of Rayford, and I'm a nutritionist with House of Rayford. Well, then the next uh, question would be, uh, JT, what's in your glass tonight? Uh, I'm in Chad's same situation. I checked with my <laughs> boss earlier and they said bourbon was a no-go. So uh, again, a bottle of Dasani, um, you know, uh, but whenever we leave here, I might, I might have a Miller. We'll see. Uh, All right. But so. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to be here. I, I, I'd love to have a glass with me, but uh, it was a no-go. Okay. If you were drinking bourbon, what would it be? Most of the ones I've had are from Sazerac. So okay, the, sure. the Eagle Rare and and yep. uh, and I Buffalo guess some Trace. of the Blantons, those types. Yeah, yeah, Buffalo Trace. Um, I, yeah, so that's that's if I drink bourbon, that's usually where it's from. All right, very well. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. Tonight, my co-host is Dr. Zach Lohman. Zach's been here uh, many times with me. Uh, Zach is Balchem's monogastric technical service lead, and uh, so welcome back, Zach. And are, are you in the same situation the other two gentlemen? I'm not. I'm working in uh, my office from home, and I'm actually going to Mexico this weekend, so I've got a fruit smash to get a little uh, beach theme going. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, that's good. So, uh, Zach, how did you get to know these two gentlemen? I understand you, you've known them uh, So, before. Chad and I have known each other for quite a few years, just from conferences and uh, meetings and things that we've ran into each other at. And JT and I actually overlapped a little bit at NC State while we were finishing up our PhDs. All right. Very well. All right. Let's get started, gentlemen. Uh, Chad, we're going to talk tonight about the impact of thermal processing on the quality uh, of protein. So let's start by talking about the various forms of thermal processing that are deployed in the industry. Yeah, so I think you can think about thermal processing um, there's two major categories I put it into. Um, it's either on the ingredient side or the complete diet side. And on the complete diet side, it's gonna be the pelleting process. You know, if you get internationally, there might be some extruded products. Um, there may be some expansion, but here in the US, we're pretty much just dealing with pellet mills, which is uh, steam conditioning. And then you have frictional heat when you're pushing that through the die. And there's also some pressure in there as well. Um, the other thing is your, on the ingredient side, it really just depends on what ingredients you're feeding and what the process is. Um, most of the time it's going to be your, 
what I would call byproduct or code product ingredients that are going to go through some additional heat processing step uh, where there's a drying to pull the moisture out or maybe a heat processing for pathogen control or, or that extrusion step as well. Um, so it can vary from soybean mill to distiller's grains, bakery byproduct mill, kind of just depends. Um, and you know, when you think about some of those byproducts, especially like bakery or something through the food industry, it may have been previously cooked, uh, turned into waste and then repurposed and then processed again. Um, so it might've actually gone through multiple heat steps um, in certain instances. Okay. I was going to kind of ask you about, uh, you know, the thermal processing that specifically soybean milk, because I know that was a, a topic of discussion during your webinar. You know, sure. what are the purposes? Is, is that done, uh, I guess, at the plant um, for mostly processing purposes and not necessarily to improve the quality uh, or, uh, or digestibility of the protein in the, in the product? Is that correct? Yeah, so there's, um, you know, without getting into too many details, I think the main you have the heating process that helps remove the hexane and the solvent extraction, but the main value of the heating step, whether it's through um, solvent extraction processing or even if you have a mechanically or extruded expelled soybean mill, uh, it's, it's to optimize that quality. So you have to kind of find that balance of first you want to put enough heat on it to get rid of your anti-nutritional factors, your trypsin inhibitors or urease and then but not too much so that you're not binding uh, mainly lysine um, in that process as well so really the importance of that heat step is is to get rid of those anti-nutritional factors and, and that's why we want it on there does thermal processing does it does it benefit or or, or harm protein utilization or both i think it's both um you know, a protein's a, a very dynamic structure with all these bonds and, and things that are in different forms. And I think if you get a certain amount of, of thermal processing on it, you start to unfold those proteins. And when you unfold them, you're providing access to enzymes. So that enhances the digestibility. Um, but then if you do too much, um, they start to bind to certain sugars and things of that nature that, that prevent them from being digested. Um, I think the other thing, thermal processing is a very broad term. It's, it's really a combination of temperature, moisture, pressure. I'm sure there's some other things um, to pH, stuff of that nature that can influence the degree of thermal processing and how it influences uh, improving or decreasing protein quality. Okay. JT, has he been right on target so far? Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, just to mirror what he said, it, it, I think of anything in thermal processing works kind of like a quadratic curve, you know, where a little bit of it is a good thing. And then once you go too far with it, it starts to uh, uh, it, you're you're no longer getting a benefit from it and you're starting to hurt yourself. So I think everything in thermal processing is figuring out where you optimize the process. OK. Because if right. we don't do enough of it, we're not improving digestibility. If we overprocess it, then we are hurting digestibility. So I think I think everything works on the curve. Yeah, I agree. I think we're also we're getting to this stage too where we are having to balance um, nutritional value with also feed or food safety value as well, and so that that quadratic curve I agree with, but then you have to also consider if you have different objectives. Because so, sometimes people may be willing to give up some nutritional value to make sure there's no salmonella or um, PED or anything like that in the feed as well. So you really have to just kind of understand what's, what's your core objective and what's, what's the value of the thermal processing and the cost associated with it. Mm -hmm. How would you gentlemen uh, characterize the quality of the soybean meal that's coming out of the commercial operations uh, these days? I'll let JT comment on this um, as he's probably dealt with it more than me, but from a research standpoint and the publications that are out there, um, you know, I the quality is good. The variability is low. Um, you know, our digestibility on the key components are high. Um, so I think, I think the quality is good, but I also think the, the better we get at doing our jobs, there's chance to capture more value. 
Um, and so all the, the, the quality is good there. That doesn't mean there's not room for improvement too and in, in how we do things and, and what we understand. Yeah, so JT, are you seeing, uh, well, first of all, do, are you measuring the quality, uh, protein quality of the incoming ingredients, specifically bean meal and some of your other uh, commodities? Yes, yes. We have a wet chemistry lab and, and several NIRs that uh, we measure quality on, but we focus primarily on its nutritional quality. Um, if you get bad bean meal, you know it. You can, you can look at it and tell if it's been over-processed. Um, finding the under-processed bean meal is a little more difficult to spot with the eye. Um, and, and we will occasionally use suppliers to help us identify plants that have, let's say, high levels of trypsin inhibitors. Um, it's not something we typically do in-house. But the, the largest changes we see in quality are typically um, year to year, depending on the harvest. And we also get quite a large variation regionally based on where we're sourcing it from. So in the Southeast, at times we might get a higher protein value uh, soybean meal versus something we brought in on rail out of the Midwest or vice versa. It just depends on the crop year. So um, this current crop year, at least for us internally, it looks like our values, our protein values are a little bit higher than they were uh, in the, for the 2020 crop. Okay. And then how often will you measure um... And, and test the commodities coming in. Soybean meal, we test every load. Every load. Yeah, because yeah. There's, a, there's typically every load. They have guarantees that they have to meet. Um, I think NOVA sets those standards. And yep. if they don't meet those uh, minimum requirements, we actually start docking them on, on how much we're paying them. So there's a large incentive for us to test every load of soybean meal. Yeah. And then I'm assuming you'll you'll reevaluate or reformulate the diet's basis, the... Uh, the content of the protein, the quality of the protein in, in that uh, soybean meal? That, that's correct. Um, what th This time of year is always, uh, we, we expect to see some changes and potentially major reformulations. Um, but like Chad mentioned, they do a pretty good job at being, um, they do a pretty good job at providing a consistent product because that's what's in their interest. And, and we graph all of this information out and it's kind of interesting because it, it almost looks like a sine wave, you know, where they 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 don't want to give away too much protein. So they, they kind of their levels will creep up and then they'll say, OK, we're giving them enough. Then they'll creep down and then we start docking them and then they creep it back up and it just moves like a sine wave all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so we keep a very close eye on it and, and we do reformulate based on the quality, at least the protein quality that's coming in. Mm -hmm. So do they blend that like different loads to kind of keep the protein where they want it or do they just happen to be pulling out of different bins each time? Uh, my understanding of the way that works is it probably depends on the amount of holes they blend back into it. Um, and that's that's a major way that they're controlling the protein content. Um, we also have the ability to dock them if they send us high fiber soybean meal as well. Um, so I think they're constantly playing with the fiber that's going back in through the holes to ultimately determine their their final protein content. And yeah, uh, these guys, most of them now are using inline NIR technology and uh, to, to make sure that they're giving you a consistent product. Hmm. Yeah, if I understand it correctly, what you said, there's a NOFA standards, which are based off fiber, protein, and moisture. And that's what you're, you're setting your contracts on to submit those claims. That's correct, not. yeah. So all, all three of those, we're testing every single load because it's a potential way for us to, to reduce our cost. Yep. Mm -hmm. Chad, can you talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, what you typically would like to see measured um, and, and some, some protocol, recommended protocol that you'd use in testing incoming uh, ingredients? Yeah, so, I mean, what I like to see measured as a university professor and so-called scientists is everything, right? And that's not practical. But uh, I mean, the first thing's protein, just like JT said, when you have these contracts set up, that's where you're gonna save money, reduce costs, is making sure, you know, you can base it on the, the NOPA standards, your contracts and, and capture that value there. Um, I think the next, the next degree of detail is your amino acid profiles, which the analysis gets more expensive 
And uh, JT, I don't know, do y'all actually measure um, lysine and amino acids at certain times to make those adjustments or you have prediction equations based on protein? We will occasionally send off samples to our, some of our amino acid suppliers to, to uh, look at the amino acid levels. Um, but generally we're using an equation based system and yeah. the R squared value isn't very good on some of those, but it's, it's about the best we can do without spending an exuberant amount of money. Um, so we, we don't have much choice other than that, you know, so, you, so we're basing it very much, you know, we're, we're basing our amino acid values off of our protein level. Um, folks are <clears throat> pushing the NIR to do this type of analysis. And, and I don't think I've seen enough of it to comment on whether it's accurate enough to trust. Um, it certainly does a great job with protein and kind of your basic proximates, but uh, a lot of people are applying equations to their protein calculation to back figure amino acid levels. So yeah. that, that would be a cheaper way to get after it rather than trying to use HPLC on all of these samples. Yeah. I think um, a lot of times too, when I think about the analysis and where I've utilize them the most is almost like a diagnostic tool. Um, for instance, we've had a scenario where we're working with a producer on, on the pig side, nursery pigs, and we switched from one soybean mill source uh, to another, and then also we had scouring issues. And so increase in scours, and then when they switch back sources to a different uh, supplier on the soybean mill side, they went away. Right. So that could be there's no telling if that's coincidence or not. But then when you start to dive into it, it's like, OK, well, what do we need to measure? Because um, crude protein is probably not going to tell you the answer there. So that's when some of these other things come into play is can you look at KOH solubility to see if maybe it's over processed or under processed? If you can't visually see it, like JT mentioned, um, do you need to look at your oligosaccharide content, which is kind of a whole separate discussion. Um, do you need to look at trypsin inhibitors or urease? Typic, the urease and trypsin inhibitor from the data I've seen, those pretty much go hand in hand from a correlation standpoint. Urease analysis is a lot cheaper. Um, you just look at the change in pH. But so it's almost becomes a kind of scavenger hunt of how do you piece together all these different analytical techniques to determine is there something different in those two suppliers that's leading to scours, which we know undigested protein can lead to to different GI issues. Um, so, so the potential's there, but trying to determine if that's the true cause or if it's if it's something else. You know, during the uh, webinar, we had uh, several questions come in that we were unable to get to, Chad. So I put a few of those uh, in here. I got one from a gentleman named uh, Tetsky, and he's asking, uh, which parameters do you consider most important for determining protein quality? And is this different for different raw materials? I am currently trying to answer that same question for myself. Um, you know, we probably the most consistent one I've seen from a protein quality standpoint in the processing is KOH solubility, um, just giving an indication of if it's over or under process and, and how soluble that protein is. It is not the end all be all, um, but it's, you know, some of the papers I've seen, some of the values I've dealt with, it's it's been the best so far. I've also had projects where I picked up differences in performance, but I can't detect it analytically. Um, I just, I don't know what's going on there. So I don't know if it was a formulation, something else. Um, but yeah, so, you know, lysine to crude protein, something that we've utilized as well, but that kind of gets to where you're to the degree of processing where lysine is actually going down. Um, I think where it gets real tricky is when you're kind of on the edge where it's enough to make a difference, but um, harder to detect. So. And it kind of comes back to what JT said, when it's over processed, you can see it, you know, uh, when it's bad, it, it's when it's, you know, just marginal, that is harder to tell that difference. I think that's where our areas to potentially capture more value are. 
All right, very well. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned there's kind of two primary areas of uh, <clears throat> thermal processing. One is, you know, with the incoming ingredients, and then two is is on the farm with pelleting. Um, is there anything that we we should cover for the audience uh, relative to incoming ingredients before we transition over to pelleting? No, I, I think we covered it so far. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunity. You know, soybean mill is JT touched on some of that. I, I think distillers grains and bakery mill there's some opportunity there to really try to understand how we improve our precision and, and utilize utilization of those ingredients um, and it's just uh, it's a cost balance there to, of your economic return too that makes it a little more difficult yeah all right then so let's start with pelleting so let's just start off with the basics why do we pellet feeds and jt they, are y'all currently pelleting do you pellet where you are now? Yes, sir. We we pellet uh, we pellet every bit of feed we make except for feeds for breeders. So um, and and like Chad mentioned, it's all when, when I when I've looked at the uh, economics of pelleting, it makes tons of sense for us to pellet feeds. Um, at least here in the southeast, it does. We're paying a premium for grains to to get here. So um, uh, it looks like a winning situation on paper. Um, you know, so, so we've been pelleting feeds as an industry for a very long time. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's just kind of normal for, for people to pellet. It's actually like you, the, the root question of why do we pellet feeds is, is hardly discussed because it's just kind of taken for granted that we're going to pellet diets. Yeah. We actually see that discussion a lot more on the swine side. Um, and kind of the rule of thumb to build off what JT just said is the higher the ingredient cost, the greater the value of pelleting. Um, and so on the swine side, you, you have populations of pigs on the East Coast and then uh, in the Midwest. And in the Midwest, some of those are closer to your, you know, the corn source and, and soybean mill. And so some of your ingredient cost is a little lower. And uh, we actually see more people in the Midwest feed uh, mash diets and not pellet more people on the East Coast or just about everybody I think on the East Coast is pelleting. So there's a more of a, a blend of those who pellet or don't pellet in the swine industry where the poultry industry, I think a large percentage pellet. And that's once again, what kind of drove me to the pelleting side being with the feed science group here at K-State is just, you know, there's so much more pelleting is just much more of a commonplace. How important is pellet quality? Back when I used to work with the ducks, it was uh, super important. And if there were 5% fines, we were having a lot of issues with it. But I know broilers don't, uh, th their diets typically aren't like that. What is kind of the cutoff that, or is it more just the actual pelleting that uh, you're seeing the, the uh, advantages of? Well, I, I think, uh, like Chad mentioned early on, there is some inherent benefit of just going through some type of thermal processing to begin the unfolding process and they, you know and there, there's literature out there that supports the idea that pelleting to some extent will improve digestibility um it, the poultry industry is funny because there are companies that preach pellet quality and make these great pellets and go through all these extreme measures to get good pellet quality and there are other companies that kind of as long as it went through a pellet mill they're fine with it and uh, both of those folks are you know large companies that still operate, still make money. Um, so I, I don't know that it's going to kill you one way or another. Um, I think it's a very difficult, I think it's very difficult for us to narrow down the true value of pellet quality and all of the research that's been done with it, as far as looking at the response in the animals, it's all done in kind of small pin scenarios. Um, but I think pellet quality you know, the largest importance for pellet quality is when you have 100 birds or 50 to 100 birds that are trying to get to one feeder at the very end of the flock. And uh, and it's very difficult for us to figure that out in a university setting. And I haven't seen someone um, really really get to the bottom of that in a commercial setting either. So I, there's, there's a lot for us to learn as far as the way pellet quality can positively impact our business. It's a very... Uh dependent situation I think uh, the we're trying to understand now on the pig side if the side the phase of production like a growing 80 pound pig versus a 280 pound pig your pigs 
your pig space uh, or feeder space per pig is different. Uh, you know, the, the how much they eat is different and trying to understand if that influences the pellet quality response. Um, we've also, you know, through just some discussions in the poultry industry, I don't, I'm not aware of how much like feeder design differs, but on the swine industry, we've kind of seen this evolution of feeder design. And if you go back to some of the old big green round feeders, uh, you don't really pick up a pellet quality response because the, the pigs will just push the feed around and they never waste it and then they end up eating it. Uh, whereas like with some of the modern design feeders, it ends up in the pit. So then that's where your feed efficiency response is coming from. So it's a, it's a feed wastage deal. And, and so it, it really just is going to depend on, on the response there. And, but yeah, you're definitely, to in order to capture that value, um, you know, you're more likely to do it with a good quality pellet, but it costs money to produce a better quality pellet. Um, you can, if you ramp up your tons per hour, your production rate, uh, you get more feed out the door fa faster and you still get that improvement in bulk density and feed handling characteristics. I understand that we've been talking a lot about the, the positives of pelleting feeds, but there are some downsides as well one of which is that it has the potential for destroying enzymes. And I believe you've done some of your schoolwork in that area and wondered if you could expound on that just a bit. Yeah, so, so that's one of the things that interested me in graduate school was um, looking at how thermal processing does potentially negatively impact uh, enzymes. And, and it certainly can. I think it depends on how you're processing your feed. Um, some of the enzymes are much more susceptible to, to thermal denaturation than others. So I've worked with some enzymes that are rock solid. Um, I think you could just throw them in a pot of boiling water and, and uh, squeeze them through a dye and they'd come out just fine. And, and we've had others that, that um, you know, you're not getting much over 180 degrees and you're starting to denature the enzyme. So uh, I, I think, you know, from a practical standpoint, it's very important to understand the enzyme that you're feeding and what its capabilities are as far as surviving the pelleting process. Um, there's no doubt, though, that, that we can, through conditioning or through our dye specs or through our formulations, we can definitely impact uh, the ability of an enzyme to survive the pelleting process. So when you say that some, uh, some survive better than others, you're talking about the specific kind of enzyme, whether it's a phytase, uh, protease, um, that, is that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So, so in, when I was in school, my graduate work, we worked with pro, uh, with phytases and NSPases specifically a couple different types. Um, I have not done much work at all with proteases on thermostability. Um, so I don't, I don't know if, if for some reason they're able to make proteases more stable than in a phytase or an NSPase. But, um, but yeah, we were using commercially available enzymes for, for all of the work we did. Mm -hmm. But we, even within phytases, there was a big range in stability, wasn't there? So we see um, yeah. it yes. all depends on what kind of, if they have a coating or not, how they're produced, all those different things can lead to, to differences in stabilities. And, what I kind of found, not, JT, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but the interesting thing is when you hit that threshold, it, it goes pretty fast. And so, you, I mean, you can go from 100% stable down to 20% in less than 10 degrees um, or somewhere around there. I mean, it, it starts to drop off fairly, fairly quick. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's a wide variety depending on the source. All right. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that's kind of the same thing that we experienced as well is um, <clears throat> once you get to the point where that protein is going to start unfolding or the enzyme, especially, you know, because it, it needs to stay structurally intact to be active. So once you get to the point where it starts to unfold one of them, it's starting to unfold all of them, you know, and, and all of its time and temperature dependent. But um, it once you hit the threshold, there's going to be a drastic decrease in what you recover. Uh, which is kind of scary, you know, for from a production standpoint, because all it takes is is you know one operator to think, well, we'll just run this five or ten degrees warmer than we normally do, and all of a sudden we have rubber bones, 
Um, so it's important to understand what, what these enzymes are able to survive and to make sure that, you know, at the feed mill, we, uh, we control that environment to make sure that our, our enzymes are viable when they actually reach the farm. Mm -hmm. Brings up a good uh, question. Uh, Chad, could you maybe kind of from an academic perspective, talk to us about what are the parameters that you recommend for pelleting in terms of time, temperature, moisture, that that kind of thing. And then I'll follow up with JT and see what, what, what do they find that works best in, uh, in practicality? Yeah. I mean, I think there's an art to it. Um, and figuring out what your, you first have to determine what's your objective. Are you trying to have a balance of throughput quality enzyme stability, or are you trying to push one or the other? Um, I think standard, we're typically around a 30 second, conditioning retention time, trying in a corn soy diet, trying to hit 185 Fahrenheit. Um, and, you know, I think your, your LG ratio on your diet is going to have a large influence too. I've, I'm guessing, you know, most people are around an LD or, or eight, or at least that's kind of what we use the most. Um, if you have an LD of a 10, it's a little on the thicker side, anything less than eight is more on the, the thin side. And, so it's just trying to find a balance of all those. Um, if you're pelleting diets with, you know, high sugar content, um, whether it's nursery pig diets, or if you add in some bakery or some other kind of product, spray dry product, you might have to back that temperature off. You know, nurture, nursery pig diets, we're closer to 145, at least on our mill. Um, some people might try to push that a little hotter, but it just depends. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of, kind of where I think the common ground is. Yeah, and JT, what are you guys doing there at the House of Rayford in terms of um, the parameters that you try to set? Yeah, so we're we're actually very similar to what Chad mentioned, and that's that's not going to be uncommon, kind of across the the industry. I think it all depends on what each individual company puts an emphasis on as far as pellet quality is concerned, you know, is it a metric that they push with their mill managers? Um, and, and, you know, in those cases, you'll typically see those folks be a little more aggressive with thermal processing. If somebody's trying to get a really good pellet, they're going to have to have a thicker dye. They're going to have to run their temperature up some and, uh, and they may even slow their pellet mills down. Uh, a lot of guys that are looking for pellet quality may force wheat into their diet as well to make sure that they can get a good pellet. So it all depends on what the outcome you want is. That's where I would love to have more data that comes directly off of a large farm where with a more dynamic situation um, than we might see in a research pen to really tell the true value of, of pellet quality because we know that if we kind of push the envelope here to get a really good pellet, we run the chance of destroying some of our our nutrients, not just our enzymes, but also our lysine. We have lots of vitamins that aren't uh, completely stable. So we have to make sure that, uh, and, and that's very much the case with, with House of Rayford, uh, we're not an extremely aggressive pelleter uh, for those reasons. We want to make sure that, that all of our nutrients are still intact. So when I do work with pe uh, pedigree birds, they're really worried about salmonella and other pathogens. And uh, we heat them up uh, really hot and we've... Uh, We've tracked a little bit of how, how things uh, degrade and are lacking, so we really have to over-formulate a lot of our diets just to get into them what we actually need. It kind of comes down to a, a, you're really just managing moisture is kind of how I view it. Because if you, if you have higher moisture ingredients, you have to back that temperature off. If you have lower moisture ingredients, you're trying to push more steam, more heat on them to get more moisture in there to get that pellet quality. Um, that's, you know, sometimes if we might have a 30 second retention time, but if we have really dry ingredients or uh, dry corn or something of that nature, we might try to bump that retention time up to 60 seconds just to get more moisture in there before it goes through the dye. Um, but just trying to find that balance there. And then, yeah, your, your salmonella control, that's that thermal processing can become a whole different story, especially if you get into hygienizers and other things like that to really crank up the temperature and time that is exposed. Yeah, that's right. And, and you'll see that with all of your uh, primary genetic companies. 
they're going to have hydrogenizers in those facilities. They're also usually using um, some other type, maybe a formaldehyde-based products to, to clean the feed up too. They go through extreme measures to ensure that they can provide salmonella-free chicks. So um, obviously for us, when we're making a broiler, we have to keep our plants clean um, and we take salmonella precautions, especially with our breeders. Um, but uh, from a feed processing side, we don't see that as a, as a strong point for us to control salmonella going into the plants. And, and on, the, on the water comment, that brings up a good point, Chad, because there's a lot of people that are, well, there's been some work done at NC State um, with adding water to diets. And it's a question we get all the time in the, in the summer, um, you know, our, our mills are often bringing in dry corn and it's already hot outside. And, we, you know, they're only supposed to go to a certain temperature and the pellet mills just don't want to run very well. Um, I've, I've seen some interesting, some interesting um, setups to, to get water into the diet. You know, people will do it at the mixer and I've even seen people uh, spraying water in the conditioners. So there's, there's, it's it's really interesting the water aspect of it and and there hasn't been a ton of work done on on how that's going to impact uh, uh proteins through the pelleting process mm -hmm. jt one of the comments you made earlier was um in in consideration of pelleting was lysine quality and chad i know you've done a lot of work with uh with looking into that and the the impact that uh, thermal processing has on protein quality can you kind of briefly kind of go over uh, some of the research that you've been doing and then what were some of the key outcomes that you found? So on the, the lysine availability standpoint and research and, and pelleting, we did it on the swine side. Um, so really what's binding that lysine is, is it's binding with sugars because of malleard or browning reaction. And we kind of potentially increase that risk over the years with by chasing diet costs. You add more free lysine in there. So um, in theory, that should potentially increase the opportunity for this browning reaction with thermal processing. You add more reducing sugars. If you have byproducts, whether it's distiller's grains or um, really bakery meal or anything like that. Um, so, you know, in theory, you're it seems like there's a greater chance for this reaction to occur by the slicing. Um, we did some studies on the swine sides. We pushed our temperature as hot as we could pelleting. We had 20% distillers, 15% bakery mill, as much free lysine as we could get in the diet and it still be realistic. Um, and we, we didn't come up with any melted reaction, no, no reduction in lysine availability. We actually improved digestibility through the pelleting process. So on the pig side, anyways, we weren't able to cross that um, that line to get into to negative lysine digestibility with the pelleting process. Um, and we, I feel pretty confident in it. We measured it on the digestibility side with iliocannulated pigs, and we also did growth performance, and it saw similar results there. Um, when you look at some of the work, um, I can't remember who, I know John Booney was involved with it. I think it was at West Virginia, but, you know, they did it on the poultry side in a very similar design um, that they ran. And I think they kind of, they might have started to pick it up when you put bakery meal in the diet and maybe showed, demonstrated a reduction in lysine digestibility uh, with that high bakery diet. So you know i'm not sure if on the poultry side if there's more work to be done if there's anything that jt's seeing in the field um but on the pig side you know we didn't we didn't cross that threshold of, of reducing digestibility yeah and there's you know for us looking just in the field and how our birds are performing things like that um i, I can't really comment to that it's it's just it's difficult to pick something like that up. You know, the best place yeah, to do sure. something like that is certainly in a university setting. Um, so, uh, and and especially for us, like I said, we we are not really aggressive uh, with our pelleting. So uh, this wouldn't be a place uh, that that we would potentially run into those issues. I don't think. I have heard stories about integrators out there being too aggressive with pelleting and, and losing breast meat yield. Um, and those types of things that, that we know are lysine dependent processes. So 
I, you know, anecdotally, um, I've, I've heard that it can happen. I, I, I have not personally seen it, though. Mm -hmm. Does it matter whether the lysine is coming from the soybean meal or whether it's a synthetic uh, source uh, in terms of uh, being impacted by the thermal processing? Um, so I think the short answer is potentially yes. Um, when we think about the browning reaction, it's that free amine group that binds to the sugar. So I'm going to do some speculation here, but my thought is the free lysine, that amine group is probably more available than, um, you know, probably depending on the protein structure within the protein source, how, you know, I think that amine group is still available, but I could speculate that it's probably more within that complex. There might be other, um, you know, bonds or some way if it's folded up more protected, not as available to be found in the browning reaction. So that, that was kind of our hypothesis going into some of our research is thinking, yeah, that amine group should be more accessible by those sugars to bind. Um, but on the pig side, we, we weren't able to demonstrate that. Okay. And I would, I would, that, I believe that hypothesis is right on because that's exactly how I would feel about it. I mean, would you just, just think about a free lysine floating around out there versus one yeah. that has other amino acids folded on it, potentially giving it some more thermostability or more protection of the amine group before, you know, a, a digestive enzyme starts to starts to break them apart. Um, uh, it, it just makes sense that a bunch of liquid lysine or, or dry lysine going in would be more available for binding. There's also been some classic research with crystalline amino acids and, and the, the speed at which they're absorbed uh, versus intact proteins or amino acids and intact proteins. And, and I think that demonstrates that, that yeah, it, it, they're absorbed more rapidly, so they, they're more available than an intact protein. Okay. I got a, a few questions here from the webinar that's kind of uh, relevant to this discussion. This one comes from Roberto. It says, uh, there seems to be a large variety of factors that affect lysine digestion. Is there a commercially feasible way for large mills to keep uh, check on how they are doing? I'm <laughs> I, don't, I don't know specifically of, of anything we can um, monitor on a constant basis that will give us that type of feedback. I mean, the, the only thing that comes to mind is that if you could build an NIR equation for that and stick it on your finished feed leg or, uh, uh, you know, under underneath pelleting or underneath cooling and potentially monitor that as a constant process. But I, in, unless you're just going to constantly, just like we would do with an enzyme, look at free lysine before you pellet, free lysine after you pellet, if you were to see a major drop off there, then maybe you're being too aggressive, but uh, I'm sure Chad could speak to this measuring free lysine all the time uh, gets to be costly and, and it's not something that we do um, very often at all. No, I, that, I don't think we're there yet. Um, on back to that question of, of digestible lysine, it, it, from everything I, I know, it's we kind of go the digestibility coefficient comes from a book value, and then we base things off shifts and analyze values. Um, you know, you might can come up with some different prediction equations to make some adjustments if you think fiber is going to shift your digestibility or or something of that nature. But no, I don't I don't think there's a clear answer. Um, for that question and you know that's we've kind of led some of that work we've done on soybean meal is to try to understand if if that if there is a difference between source because we know amino acid content changes and we can adjust for that in formulation but are you still leaving some value on the table because that digestibility changes um, and and is there, do we need to be considering different coefficients for different sources or not? Mm -hmm. Melissa is asking, uh, what, what would you say the dietary sugar concentration break point would be that results in reducing digestible lysine? Um, so I think what she's asking, is there, is there a certain amount that, that, that uh, 
causes the reduction in the, in the lysine digestibility. So I don't, I don't know if there's, I don't know what that is. Um, and like we kind of said earlier, the chicken side, there might be some more debate research that needs to be done on the pig side. I think the sugar content, the ingredient that has the sugars in it are limiting are preventing us from getting to that point. So the more sugar I put in my diet, I have to drop my temperature so the dye doesn't flow. Um, and so I think just the characteristics of the ingredients aren't allowing us to get to the temperatures that's gonna to cause that binding, at least on the pig side from the data we have. Um, and so it's kind of this balance of, you know, sugars are sticky, they, they absorb that moisture, at least like your whey ingredients and things like that. So it, it's kind of a, a catch 22. It, it prevents us, you know, we can't pellet a high sugar diet at 185. It's just not going to happen. Um, so I, I don't know if we get, can necessarily get to that point where, um, to answer that question. Mm -hmm. All right. I got one more here real quick uh, Ibra, from Ibrahim. Should we also consider the impact of thermal processing on starch gelatization and its impact on animal performance? I think um, there's there's been some interesting work done at NC State recently um, from a from a master student who's moved on to do to to go to another school, but I, I don't know what I'm at liberty to say here. But um, she it, it should be published. Um, through the university, but they they did a lot of work, looked at a lot of starch gelatinization and pretty much showed that there isn't any. I mean, if there, based on the data I saw, there was zero evidence that starch gelatinization was occurring. And these are in diets with lots of moisture, um, actually adding water into the diet and running at very high temperatures. And if you just look at some of the, the basic um, uh, old grain cereal literature, I mean, they'll, they'll tell you that there's not enough moisture in the pelleting process to really drive starch gelatinization. It, it requires quite a bit of moisture and we're nowhere close to that while we're pelleting diets. Yes, yeah, so I agree. Um, the interesting thing is one, when you look at starch digestibility in the bird and the pig, it's already extremely high. I mean, we're talking 96, 98%. Um, depending on what data you look at. So even thinking about, okay, if I do gelatinize it, how much more room for improvement is there anyways? Um, that there could be some, but um, I agree with JT's comment. The work we've done, you know, we see, oh, I'd have to dig the data up, but I think coming out of the conditioner, we had roughly 6% gelatinization. And then once we pushed it through the dye, it was around that 12% gelatinization. Um, where if you look at extruded products, they're getting more like 75% gelatinization. So in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's a very small amount. Um, and we actually did a feeding study here where we, the other thing you have to, when you think about research, anything you're doing to increase gelatinization could also affect other things like pellet quality. So you kind of get these confounded effects going on too. So teasing out those differences becomes really difficult. Um, we were fortunate enough, we had two different sources of corn um, that gelatinized different in the pelleting process um, when we pelleted them exactly the same. So we kept all of our conditions the same, our pellet quality ended up being the same. Um, and I think one of them ended up with maybe 3%, 4% more gelatinized starch in it. Um, and we didn't pick up any, I mean, we picked up there might have been some minor differences in final body weight or carcass weight, but nothing on the feed efficiency side that I recall. Mm -hmm. So, Very well, gentlemen, as we kind of move toward closing this out, is there any big uh, topics that we've uh, not covered yet related to uh, thermal processing? This is a conversation that could go on for a very long time. You know? We've just scratched the surface here. Um, you know, but I, I think the, the big takeaway, uh, at least at least on my part, is that it's it's you know any if we over process anything, it can be bad, and not processing is also bad. You know, so we have to list somewhere in the middle, and unfortunately, we don't have great ways to measure either side of that. You know, as far as from a production standpoint, is there something we can measure every single day? 
Um, and you could potentially correlate some of these things back to PDI. For example, that's, that's some of the things we did uh, when I was in graduate school was we saw that phytase recoveries were very well correlated with our pellet durability index. So with enough work, you might be able to build a uh, data set that could kind of say, hey, you want your pellet durability index to be around this point, but no more, because we know when we go beyond that point, that's when we start to see you know, the, the lysine becomes bound and uh, or, or you're denaturing most of the enzymes out there. So hanging out somewhere in the middle is not such a bad thing, uh, but I think a lot of that's just because there's a lot more that, that we need to learn, a lot that we don't understand about these processes before you make decisions like that. Hmm. That's a great wrap up, JT. Um, Zach, what would you add? What, what are some takeaways that, uh, that you'd leave with the audience? I think the main takeaways, uh, there's uh, incoming ingredients, consistency and quality are uh, very important. And the uh, correct time and temperatures are important to uh, protein digestibil digestibility as well as vitamin enzyme uh, stability. And Chad, we'll give you the final word here to wrap us up. You know, I think um, every production system is different, whether it's poultry, swine, you know, genetics, uh, breeder stock, or, you know, broiler production. And I think the key is to understand your objectives, understand your ingredients, um, know your supplier, work with your supplier to, to wrap your head around this ingredient quality things, um, and then understand how all these things influence the pelleting process. And it, it really just comes a multifactorial response to, to understand time, temperature, moisture, and, and how to wrap it all together to, to provide a good quality ingredient. And it's not gonna be the same in every system, um, but just being knowledgeable about it and how to adjust things is gonna put you in a better place. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. As JT said, you know, this is a big subject. We've just scratched the surface. And so I'll be looking forward to having you guys back here uh, once again uh, at the Real Science Exchange to kind of dig a little bit deeper sometime in the future. So I want to thank you for that. I uh, also want to thank our loyal listeners for stopping by once again here at the Real Science Exchange. I hope you learned something and I hope you had as much fun as we did. As a reminder, our Real Science Lecture Series continues with monthly topics for both the ruminant and monogastric audiences. Our next webinar will be on December 14th with Brett Stewart from Glo Global Agritrends, and he'll share his thoughts on how uh, 2022 will shape up for all of agriculture. To register, visit balchem.com slash real science. If you like what you heard tonight, please remember to drop us a five-star rating. Don't forget to request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt. All you need to do is like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Mm -hmm.